Hi, welcome to the first video in the build series where I will be retrofitting a small MCO CNC lathe. I will cover the entire build process including detailed information on part selection, electrical connections, custom parts I designed for the build, the new CNC controller, etc. etc. Also, I will cover issues I ran into and how they were resolved. By sharing this journey, I hope it helps others that are thinking about taking on a CNC build or conversion, or for those who are just interested in general in CNC machines for the home shop. For years, I've wanted to buy a CNC lathe to play around with at home. However, since I only have limited space and I would need to put it on the third floor, I was looking for a small lathe that I could carry up the stairs. A while ago I found an old MCO PC Turn 50 lathe that had seen better days. The entire electrical cabinet was removed so I could only reuse the mechanical parts. This lathe was a great opportunity for me as I was able to get a small CNC lathe and also get in over my head with a new project. In order to keep the video short and manageable, I've divided the build into several videos. Also I will probably have to make some update videos later on as the lathe is essentially working, but more like a minimum viable product. But I wanted to share what I have so far. Let me know if you have any comments or ideas for improvements. In this first video, I will do a bench test with the new CNC controller and cover the wiring of the motor and VFD settings. In following videos, I will cover the entire project from start to finish, including work on the machine cabinet and controller housing, Stepper motor replacement, the tool turret, electronics, wiring, cosmetic fixes, safety switches and much more. As you can see there are no electronics left inside the cabinet. The old electronics came with the lathe separately, but I'm not going to reuse these parts. The machine housing also needs to be fixed up, as it has no bottom and no rear panel. Originally there used to be a red cabinet at the back, with all of the electronics housed in it, but I am going to try and fit everything into the main housing. I bought an offline CNC controller, the SZGH 990TDB. If you're looking for a cheap CNC controller for a mill, there are a lot of options. However, I found for lathes, there are far fewer models. And although you could technically use a milling controller for a lathe, I would advise against it because you would be missing out on a lot of lathe specific features like tool turret control, can cycles and a logical keyboard. I chose the SSGH controller because it seemed to have all the functionality I needed and several detailed manuals in English. After confirming with the sales support on the AliExpress store that I was actually ordering the correct model for my application, I ordered it and added an external I.O. board and spindle encoder as well, which are sold separately. Even though I bought the low-end model, it still has a lot of features that you would only find on an industrial CNC controller such as position feedback for the axes, a user programmable PLC and macro support. It looks a bit like a classic Vanu controller, but in my opinion the SRGH interface is much more intuitive. By the way, I have no affiliation with this company whatsoever and I bought the unit with my own money. The price for the controller is very low, at around 350 euros, but by the time shipping, import taxes and accessories are added, it will come to around 800 euros. I think it is worth it, but 800 euros is a lot of money for a DIY project. I will link pricing and part numbers for all components used in this build below in this video description. The controller comes with almost all of the wires you need. Only the one for the linear scales is not supplied, but I will not be using that anyway. The connection is made with sub-D connectors. On one end I like this because you can make your own uh, replacement cables, since sub-D connectors are very common. The downside is that they stick out quite far, so making a flat housing for the controller is not that easy, at least not with the supplied cables. Three of the cables go to the I.O. board, so you can use that to connect sensors, switches and external loads through the onboard relays. The lathe still had the old stepper motors mounted to the axes, but I had no idea how to drive these and also they are of the open loop type, meaning you will not know if you lost any steps during a program. I found this set on AliExpress. I was looking specifically for a stepper motor with a holding torque of around 1 Nm, similar to the original steppers, because I did not want to risk damaging the mechanics with overpowered stepper motors. 
Also, there is limited size available for mounting the motors, so these look like a good fit. They are three-phase motors, which is not the most common, but it does have some advantages. From what I've read, the three-phase motors have a higher torque than two-phase models at higher RPMs, and also run quieter at higher speeds. I was looking more at the size and torque rating. The fact that these are three-phase motors is coincidental. The steppers are of the semi-closed loop type, where the stepper communicates its position back to the driver, not to the CNC controller. They have an encoder on the back of the motor that communicates its position back to the stepper driver, which in turn can correct for any errors by steering the motor back into its intended position. I have more details on this in a previous video on the controller for my CNC router, if you're interested. The motor has two cables to connect it to the stepper driver. The first cable has three leads for driving the motor, and the second cable has six leads for the encoder. The stepper driver has a set of dip switches on the side, four of which are used to select the micro step setting. More on that later on in this video series. To find out what dip switches 5 and 6 were for, I did some Google translating with the Lens app. It turned out that switch 5 was to flip the direction of the motor. This is very useful as you can just flip the switch if the axis you are driving is moving in the wrong direction. With switch number 6 you can tell the driver if it needs to run in open loop or closed loop mode. You can also order a communication cable with these drivers to connect it to your PC and change parameters of the driver. I have not looked into this yet, but it is a nice option to have if you want to dig deeper into the driver settings and for troubleshooting. So it was time for some bench testing before mounting the components into the lathe. The manual states that you have to connect the CNC controller through an isolation transformer to avoid any electrical interference. I am not sure if this is really necessary, but to avoid any risk of damaging my new controller, I did end up connecting it to an isolation transformer. I mounted a wooden plate to the controller temporarily, so it would stay upright. For this test I am using a generic 24V power supply. I will change this out later for a fanless model that can be mounted to a DIN rail. Here you see the connections on the stepper drivers, with from left to right. The 24V input voltage, the UV and W connectors for the stepper motor wires, the encoder connector, the alarm connector, which I'm not using for this test, the enable pins, which I also left unconnected for now, and lastly the direction and pulse signal wires coming from the CNC controller. All of the wires supplied with the controller are very nicely labeled, so this really helps and makes your life a lot easier when connecting everything. I will place a PDF on my website with the complete wiring diagram and I will update this if I make any changes later on. See the link in the description. This is the first test with just one motor connected. By pressing the manual jog buttons, I am checking if the motor responds properly to the signals from the CNC controller. This seems to work fine. The second bench test was with both the X and Z motors connected. Here I am running a test program that came pre-installed on the controller. The motors are not set up for the correct gearing ratio on the machine yet, but at this moment I was only interested if the controller was working at all and if the motors were moving. So another successful test. I am taking small steps in this build while checking every time if the feature I added to the machine works before moving on to the next. This makes troubleshooting a lot easier and really gives you the feeling that you are making progress. The MCO lathe uses a three-phase spindle motor that used to be connected to a proprietary drive. I will be reusing the original motor, but I will connect it to a new VFD. I am definitely not an expert on VFDs and motor wiring, but I did some online research and uh, went through the product manuals. Based on this information, I experimented with the settings and came up with a setting that works for me. When I start working with the lathe, I will probably change some of these settings, but I think for now I have some good starting values. The motor can be connected in both Delta and Star configuration. Specifications for each case are available on the nameplate. My motor is connected in the Delta setup. In this configuration it works at 230V AC 50Hz and draws 0.37kW. Some other data that we can read from the nameplate 
is the full load amps rating, which is 2.1 amps. It also indicates that it runs at 1370 revolutions per minute at 50 Hz. We will need some of these values when configuring the VFD parameters. All of the mentioned values are for the delta configuration. If you are using the motor and star configuration, the values after the slash apply. For delta configuration, each coil in the motor is connected on both ends to one of the other coils. In the star setup, all three coils are connected on one end to a neutral line. I have opened up the terminal box in the motor to see how it was wired, and it's indeed a delta configuration. Since I had it open, it was a good time to do some basic checks to see if there weren't any major issues with the motor, as I had never seen it running. The resistance on all three coils should be roughly the same, which would indicate that they are still intact. The resistance is indeed very similar, so that seems to be good. The resistance between the ground wire and the housing is very low, which is how it's supposed to be if the contacts are properly tightened and free of corrosion. So this is also ok. The motor should be driven by a three-phase connection. And this is where the VFD comes in. A VFD creates a three-phase connection for the motor from a single-phase input, while also allowing you to change the frequency of the three-phase output. This enables an infinitely adjustable RPM for the motor. The full load amps rating on the nameplate was used for sizing the VFD. The VFD should be rated to at least as high as the full load amps rating. From what I've read, people are using a rule of thumb where the VFD is sized to twice the full load amps rating of the motor. In my case, 2.1 amps times 2 is 4.2 amps. For sake of simplicity, I'm rounding this down to 4 amps. It may not have been the best choice, but I looked for a cheap VFD just to limit my losses in case it turned out not to work for any reason. I found this Saco VFD on Amazon. It is a 0.75 kilowatt model with a maximum output of 4 amps. Make sure to check the comment section, where I will place information on any updates or corrections that I made since uploading this video. The Saco VFD is nice and compact and seems well built. The main drawback of this model is that the fan is not very quiet and it remains on all of the time. The noise will be less audible when it is in the back of the lathe, but still I would have liked it if it would have stopped when idling or have a quieter fan altogether. Besides that, this VFD seems to be working fine. I will post the changes to the parameter settings that I made for my lathe in the website article linked in the description. Also I will likely update these settings later when I have more experience with the lathe, in that case I will also update the written article. Here I am doing a bench test with the VFD and the spindle motor. The components used for this are the VFD, the mainline filter, a ferrite ring, the motor and some cables. I'm using Wago 221 series splicing connectors to make all of the connections. These connectors are really fantastic. They work on wires from 0.2 to 4 mm squared or from 24 to 12 uh, American wire gates, whether they are stranded, solid or have a ferrule on the end. I use them all over my house in ceiling and wall boxes for mains power, but they are also very useful for some flexible prototyping. As mentioned earlier, the VFD is connected to single phase mains power. In order to reduce electrical noise in the mains line, I have placed a two stage power line EMI filter between the mains plug and the VFD. This is rated at 20 amps, which is plenty for this application. The wires should be run through a ferrite ring to reduce electrical interference. I am using a delta zero phase reactor for this. Just to avoid any confusion, Delta is the brand name here. I am not referring to the Delta wiring of the motor. The noise filter is designed specifically for use with VFDs. It should be placed over the lines as close as possible to the VFD. Each of the three wires should be individually looped through the ring four times to achieve the maximum filtering effect. I am not able to measure the effectiveness of these filters, but I have not experienced any issues on any of the other electronic components so far, so this seemed to work.
The motor is connected to the UV and W terminals of the VFD. If the motor turns in the wrong direction, you can just swap any of these three wires and will turn in the opposite direction. For now, I've made a couple of key changes to the parameters to get started. By default, the motor control is set to VF control, which is the most simple control mode. This works, but makes the motor emit a high pitch noise. I changed the setting to sensorless flux factor control mode, which made a big difference. It sounds much better now. This mode is an efficient method to control a motor and adapts to the motor dynamics without the need for an encoder feedback. I'm not going to pretend that I fully understand how this works, but the important thing is that it does work. Another thing that I changed was the carrier frequency. This is the switching frequency of the VFD. A higher frequency generates a cleaner waveform, reduces high pitch noise from the motor and increases efficiency. There are however also downsides. It reduces the life of the VFD, generates more heat and increases EMI, which may affect the functioning of other components in the system. So there is a trade-off. I am setting this as high as possible for now, but I might need to lower it if I run into issues with EMI. More details on the settings that I changed on this VFD can be found on my website, linked in the description. Also make sure to check out the video from James at Cloud42, linked below, for much more detailed information on VFD settings. Okay, that is it for part one. If you have any questions or comments so far, please let me know in the comments below. Thanks for watching.